starting a parent fellowship time. And just a time to connect families and grandparents, parents, whoever could come and be a part of this time. So we are hoping to do this once a month. And we're very thrilled that um, Dr. Chris Meyer um, a volunteered or was maybe arm twisted that she would come and speak to us this um, very first month this year. So um, she's the principal here at St. Paul's, and we're just very excited to um, have her today. Um, a couple things um, coming up. We have been repainting and remodeling these classrooms that are the former offices. And we are looking for someone um, or a crew of people who would like to help do a little bit of construction. Um, we need a new wall put up. And if anyone is, you know, semi-talented, I'm not personally on building, but um, I will send us a uh, sign up around um, if you, if we could have, if it would take long, I don't think it would take more than a few hours, but um, we just need a new wall put up in the classrooms. So I'll send that around. And then also looking ahead into December, um, we are going to be doing um, the Christmas program in December 13th. And part of that program is we're going to have the students do um, some artwork, and we'll, we're going to be displaying that for the whole congregation to see. And we need a few volunteers to come in, maybe for an hour or two the day before, which is December 12th, and um, help us display that artwork that all the kids in God's Zone and Saints Alive will be making. So if that's something that you would like to help with, um, I will send that sign up around too. Um, and we will get an email out with more specific details as it gets closer. Um, so, over here. And let's welcome Chris. I used to give them all the time. When I was a school counselor, we used to always, um, the school counselors would give a monthly parenting workshop for our parents in the community where we were living. And uh, we, only, we found that if we put discipline in the title, we had a full room. Because everybody was always wondering, how can we handle our kids? But this is today, we're going to talk about nurturing the relationships in the family. It is my favorite, one of my favorite topics to talk about. I gave my dad a book for Christmas once. It said, Grandpa, tell me your stories. And, he, and every day there was a question about his life. And then he put it by his breakfast table and he filled it out. And at the end of the year, he gave it back to me. My favorite day was August 3rd. And August 3rd said, what is the best piece of advice that you can give me? And my dad wrote, and I memorized it, he said, as a psychiatric social worker once said to me, relationship is everything. It's not one thing amongst many things. It's everything. If relationships are good, good things will happen. If they're not good, good things probably won't. We can form both sides of the relationship, but we can form our side through love and forgiveness and it'll affect the other as well. Relationships are everything. So we're gonna talk about that. My mom and dad were great models for me, and Donnie's as well, and um, as we raised our children. When I started studying um, counseling, I one of the books that I pulled from my dad's library was by Dreikers, Rudolf Dreikers, um, anyway, called Children the Challenge. And I heard his voice all through this book, book because it, it was wise and he raised it wise. But the little things that he, we learn that we can instill in our own parenting styles and building the relationships of family are so powerful. You know, it just makes me think of a, you know, the struggles as a parent. There's this guy in this grocery store and he had a kid in the car and the kid is just kicking in and he's saying naughty words and he's trying to spit and do all these things. And the father's like, Albert, be kind. Albert, don't, don't spit. Albert, don't swear. Albert, don't do, you know. And finally, this lady in the grocery store came up to him and said, that little Albert has to be the luckiest kid in the world to have such a patient dad like you. And the dad looked at her and said, he's not Albert, I'm Albert. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, sometimes we just don't know what to do. We try our best. I think that's the most important thing. You know, I read also one time at a, in a study um, addictions, one of the things that said that the, the great recovery for people that struggle with addictions, if they can have a look back 
on strong traditions and rituals in their growing up years. So it's a good time to start thinking about what are your rituals, what are your traditions that you're instilling in your own family? Like prayers before you pray, before you eat, before you go to bed, little, um, little devotions before you go to sleep with your family. This is my... I just, I, I, in relationships, it's so well um, defined for us in the Bible, the fruits of the Spirit. I, when I was working in the public school system, I wore one of those bracelets that said WWJD, because, you know, in the public system, you really can't refer to um, your faith as much. And the rural stuff, we, we did anyway. So, but I thought this was my way of moving my faith, you know, WWJD. And the fruits of the Spirit, you don't always need words. You need, you need modeling. It's like, what would Jesus do in all that we do in building our families? So that's what we're going to do is look at those little, some of the fruits that I think are my favorite things. And we're going to start out with kindness. Several years ago, we were in a hotel or an airport um, line, you know, to get checked in, you know, through security. And you know how we are, they snake through the airport. So we were behind this one guy, the head of a baby suitcase he was going to try to take on without checking. And at the end of the line was a woman that worked for the airlines, and she had this prototype of the overhead bin, and then she'd check and see if the suitcase would fit in there. So the guy in front of us, she said, Sir, would you mind seeing if this would fit in this thing? It just looks a little bit. And so he put in there, and it didn't fit. Oh, she said, I'm really, really sorry, but it's not going to fit in the overhead bin. I think you're going to have to check it. Would you mind taking it over there and checking it? Oh, oh, okay, he, he did, without even hesitation. If she had said, there's no way that's gonna go in, you have to check it, that's way oversized. He would have just, well, I've done it before, but you know, the way you approach something, you get the response that you, you start with. I think that's such an important thing. So how do we model kindness? Ephesians 4.34, it's a little song. Be e kind, one into another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just this God for Christ sake has forgiven you. Do, 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 do. Ephesians 4.32. How can we put some of these, these verses that remind us how we want to model and live? But Ephesians 4.34 should be something that is in our hearts and in the way we think. When our kids were born, um, I breastfed them. And as I, all, I always prayed over them while I nursed them. And one, word, one little thing I always pray is, may you grow up and be kind. May you grow up and be kind. May you grow up and be kind. Southwest Airlines has a page in their employee handbook has two words. Be nice. That's it. When I think about us as parents and growing our children, are we modeling that to them? We expect that from them. But are we modeling modeling it back to them. I just think so much about that. John, there's a guy that, um, oh, I got it right here. Joseph, I think I put it in your handbook. Joseph Jobert, he said, children need models more than they need critics. There was a guy that was um, going on a train once, and he was uh, sitting in his seat, and a guy come, came in to go on the train, right? He was drunk out of his mind. Sat in the seat behind him, reached in his coat, pulled out a flask, and said, would you like a drink? And John Turnbull turned to him, and he said, no, thank you. But he said, um, oh, well, just a minute, I forgot how it goes. Oh, just a minute. You no, know, he said, no, thank you, but I can see you're a generous person, or something like that. Oh, I can't believe I told that thousands of times. It just went <laughs> on my head. But because of the way he responded to him, they started a conversation, and the man turned his life to Christ before he left the train. All because John Turnbull was willing to compliment instead of condemn. That goes back to modeling kindness. Are we complimenting our children? We're going to we're going to look at the flip side in just a little bit. When I was in high school, we were coming out of church once, and um, there was a mom that had three daughters, and she was saying to them, "Well, get them home and get that done," you know, and she just you know that kind of. Mm -hmm. And my mom talked to us later, and she goes, do I sound like that to you? And so we talked about that, because she said, it's always to me important to say please and thank you, even in our families. I'll never forget that she said that. So we always say to our kids, 
What do you say? What do you say? But are we doing it back to them? Are we saying please? Are we saying thank you? Every single chance we get, our kiddos get models, but we need to have them become. Matthew 7, 12 says, treat other people exactly as you would like them to treat you. That body language speaks volumes. I think so. Think about, you have anybody in your mind? Do you have an example in your mind that thinks if they'd only said thank you, if they'd only said please, it would have been a different thing. Or look at the tapes you might have in your own head of your growing up. We always have the opportunity to edit. And that's important to know. We always, growing up, we often say, well, I'm not going to do that. But are you following through on those things that you wanted to be different for you? I had this, <laughs> I had this whole file that I did before I left um, counseling world in schools. If these are kids that, and I asked them this question. Tips, what would, tips would you like, to, parenting tips do you want for your own parents? <laughs> and they said, give them responsibility. I mean, I have these, they're all hand, handwritten. Take them places, give them the time limit, $10 allowance. You know, <laughs> it's, just, it's just full of great little things. How, how do you want your dad to treat, or your parents to treat you? So think about that. So that's kindness. Looking at modeling encouragement makes me think of these two frogs that were with a group of frogs going down this um, path in the woods. And I maybe you've heard me tell this story before. The two frogs in front fell in this big pit. Oh, man. The other frogs stood around. They looked on that pit. They go, whoa, it's deep. They're never going to get out. And the frogs down at the bottom, they're just panicking. They're trying to jumping, trying to get out, trying to get out. The frogs at the top go, it's so useless. They're never going to get out. And so they started calling them, forget it. You're never going to get out. You might as well get it over with and die because you're not going to get out. And they're jumping, trying to get out. They said, forget it. You're never going to get out. Just get it over with. Get just laid down and die. And they're jumping, trying to get out. Finally, one guy, one frog just laid over and died. And the other frog just keeps jumping, jumping, and they said, very good, you're never going to get out. And he jumped out. And so the frog stood around, and they said to the frog, didn't you hear us telling you? You should just get up, give it up, you're never going to get out. And the frog looked at the others and said, oh, that's what you were saying. I'm almost completely deaf, and I thought you were encouraging me. <laughs> <laughs> Encouragement. Our, our words, our vehicles, they can give life, or they can take it away. Many, almost everybody, hardly anyone, goes through life without a message that wounded you. And it wounds especially from parents. So when we have our words, if we do those wrong, you know, we don't always encourage, we don't always say the right thing. We can always go back and ask for forgiveness. Say, I'm sorry. Say, I maybe bring it together. And it fix the wounds right then and there. Then you don't carry those things with you all your life. So keep thinking of how many times you have the opportunity to ask for forgiveness when you've known you've blown it. I remember so many times I was at the end of my rope. And I just, I didn't remember. I remember, I remember when my daughter, our daughter has Asperger's, so she's very rigid. And I remember before we knew that, she would not wear anything else. She had one outfit she wanted to wear. And finally I said, okay, I'm going to get a magic go and blow up, burn up all your clothes. What is an awful thing to say? But when you're at the end of your rope, you do that as a parent. You always have opportunities to edit and ask for forgiveness. I have the opportunity to have the little kids come to my office in school <laughs> as a principal. Sometimes they have to go. But all of a sudden I realized, and then in a Lutheran school, you have the opportunity to pray with them. And so now before they go back to the classrooms, we have a prayer and I ask them, how do you think we should pray? And then they have to lead the prayer. If they're too little, so they, they, then we do it together. But it's a really neat thing. And then we go to the person in the school that they need to ask if it's a teacher, if it's a student, they have to say, I'm sorry. And then we're not trying to teach them to ask for forgiveness. I think that's a great thing, and we as parents can model and grow relationships strongly that way. John Gottman is a therapist, marriage therapist out of the University of Washington in Seattle, and he has, um, he, he deals with couples and families a lot. He has a thing for four things he calls the uh, four horsemen of the cop apocalypse. He said these are four things that 
will um, degrade a relationship if they're not tended to. And um, in marriage and in families, those four things are criticism, um, stonewalling, which means you just shut down, you don't talk, defensiveness, and contempt. And so when we think about encouragement, we can do so much with our very tone of voice. Tone is huge, I think, in building relationships. Tone is, you know, think about Jesus' tone. I think about what it must have been like to listen to him. Wouldn't you have loved to hear the tone of his voice? Of love, of care, of forgiveness. You know, there's at times he was very stern as well. Because he was forming and shaping, just as you as parents are forming and shaping. And um, John Gottman goes on to say, every time we say, you always, you always, or you never, that tone sets up defensiveness. And the, the bridge is gapped in forming those relationships that help child, children grow and learn through those mistakes that they made. That's how they learn. That's how they learn. Could you, I um, witnessed amazing parenting the other day in the school. I had a little fellow in my office, and I always tell the kids when they come into my office that they have to call your mom and dad. When you're sent to the principal's office, that means after we get done, I have to call your mom and dad. And um, we always try to use it for growing and a learning thing. Well, when I called this mom, she said, can I come up right away? And we can meet the three of us? I said, okay, and she did. And I witnessed amazing parenting. She looked at her, little child and she said in you know there's two ways you can say this is unacceptable behavior you can say this is unacceptable behavior or you can say this is unacceptable behavior look at tone from one to the other and you, this is not going to happen again i don't want to be called here again and and then she went on to say this is not you you are a leader so she grew this little, little teeny weeny kiddo and recognizing what his strengths were. You are a leader. This is not how leaders act. I, and then she put this, then she put a, uh, a name, sweetie. This is not how leaders act, sweetie. She was very stern and she had high expectations, but she also had love and warmth. And then she said, let's hug. Wow, that was amazing parenting. I'd love that. We can do it. Criticism often puts highlights on the behavior. Over and over, they will soon start getting that secondary benefit, we call it. So if they get criticism, if they get scolded enough, in our busy time, they'll act out more because it gets the attention they want from the parent. That's a, kind of a hard thing. And sometimes, if they get the same messages, by the, then they'll start giving out those messages. It can happen. And so... It's one of those things we always watch. Here's an old book. James Dobson's a Christian psychologist. He wrote this years and years ago called um, The Strong Old Child. In it, he tells about the night watchman. He said the night watchman has to go around and check all the doors, you know, at night to see they're locked. He doesn't want to find them open, but he has to read them. Think about that. When your kids push your buttons, they don't want to find them open, but they got to read them. That's how they're made. That's how they learn. I love that little story. So, on the flip side, if we just keep, oh yeah, you're going to have, we have to still form and mold, but it's how we do it because we are facing a society that has a lot of entitled kids. They think they deserve the world, so give it to me. I mean, I don't have to listen because I'm wonderful. You know, there's that other flip side. It's a balancing act. There's a lady named Carol Dweck. She, this would be a great one, the book to, to read if you haven't read it already. I use it as a textbook in, in teaching counselors. She, it's, on, it's called Mindset. She talks about growth mindset and fixed mindset. Growth mindset, or a fixed mindset is those that think this is how big smart I am, this is how smart I'm always going to be, this is the end, you know, I can't do any more than this. Growth means, okay, I can grow, I can figure it out. Fixed mindset. If they make mistakes, they defend it. Well, it's because, I mean, and they have to always live up, live up. Growth means mindset said, I, I, I messed it up, but I think I can try it again. What she also talks about is how we praise. When I taught in China, they called their, um, their kids at home little emperors. 
because they were just given everything they wanted and they just started to act like little emperors. Carol Dweck said, you praise the effort. We get so used to thinking, okay, we have to build their self-esteem, we've got to build their self-esteem. So we say, hey, you're great, oh man, everything, everybody gets a prize, okay, we're great. And then we build the entitlement. But if we praise the effort, wow, I love the way you tied your shoe. You took that time to do, so you praise the effort, and that builds, it builds a strong child. I think that's a little tidbit. If you take home anything, take home, praise the effort. And look at the way we praise things. Proverbs 22, 6 says, Train up a child when he is young in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Ah, I love that. So, give him something, not baseless, self-esteem, like you're just great, but put something with it, some meat to take, so they can know who they are. Here's another one to model. I was down in um, Ames um, about 10 years ago, and I was buying a phone in the Best Buy. Oh and it was when you bought phones <laughs> in Best Buy and they were just, you plugged them into the wall. <laughs> Is that funny or changing? And anyway, he said, it has a guarantee. The battery's not guaranteed it goes, but you could bring it in and say it doesn't work and we went no. And I said, oh, I'm a school counselor and I, I model telling the truth. <laughs> And so I use that as a lesson in guidance classes for that whole week. And I think modeling truth and trust is huge in nurturing relationships. What would Jesus do? Those little white lies, okay, when we go into the movie, just tell them you're 10 so you get it. How many times do parents unintentionally model not, not, what is the opposite of trustworthiness? I can't remember. But, so I think trust means to me is being truthful, being trustworthy, um, respecting, um, believing in someone, telling the truth. It's so important and it's so easy when we can develop the habit. Just develop the habit. My dad always said three words. Assign people value. I think that believing in our kids, showing them that we believe in them, is building a sense of trust, that they trust that we are going to stand behind them, that we see something in them that maybe somebody else doesn't. And I think another thing that goes with it is to help them discover their abilities and their talents. You know, um, we all have to face struggles along the way. We cannot, we cannot prevent it, and we as parents need to help nurture the ability for kids to see that they can get through hard times. We're afraid to sometimes in our society. We're afraid to have them take learn those hard lessons. But we can do it in gentle ways. I had a little boy that I worked with. Um, and let me let me go back to this because I think if we don't teach kids to learn how they can get through hard times, then then we nurture a victim mentality. My research is in resiliency, and I always say the giraffe is my example of resiliency, how people bounce back from hard times. Did you know that, and this might be a myth, but somebody told me, so I'm believing it. <laughs> I'm really gullible, but if it works for the teaching tools. They, somebody told me that the giraffe is always born at night. You know why? Because it has to get on its feet by morning to run away from predators. And the other thing they told me that giraffes drop six feet to their birth. So this told me that God created us to be resilient, to get through hard times. So it's okay to work through with kids, to let them, let them struggle to get through hard times so that they build those skills. There's this little boy that I worked with as a school counselor, and he and his two siblings experienced things with um, a mom's boyfriend that child should experience. And so mom's out of the picture and dad was raising the kids by himself. And then um, came the time that dad got a, a, a job in the cities and the kids were going to move away. And so Michael came into my office the day before he was going to move. And we had a lot of time together, you know, and um, with a couple years that, the, that they had gone through the stuff they went through. And when he, uh, when he was going to go, I said, Michael, how did you do it? 
How did you get through all that you did and be so strong like you are today? And he looked at me and goes, I learned that. Be patient. Things get over and done with. <laughs> and I said, let's make a poster. So we made a poster. He drew a picture. Don't worry, he said. I guess not be patient. Things get done and over with. And he drew a little sad, crying face. And then he drew a ah, strong face. <laughs> Michael Lynch. So we put this on this wall. We started making a wall of wisdom. So when kids had these moments, we made a poster, laminated, and put it on the wall of wisdom. I was teaching um, counselors, and I found a counselor in Western Iowa that was one of my students that had him in his school. He was graduating that year, and he was doing well. Isn't that exciting? So we can nurture their growth through hard times. Michele oh, Michelangelo said, well, he, you know, he talks about this. How am I doing? Am I doing? Is it time? Nope, you're good. Are you doing good? You're good. I missed perfect. I get so scared of you because I always have so much more than I have. Okay, so I think an encouragement. Always look for the treasure in your child. There's just two, two stories um, about Michelangelo. He talked a story about when that he was walking by some guys that were cutting um, stones into squares, you know. And he came to the first guy, he goes, what are you doing? I'm cutting blocks out of the stone. Cutting blocks. He came to the next guy, he goes, what are you doing? He was doing the same task. The guy goes, I'm building a cathedral. Do you have kids at home, or are you raising treasures? Right, is a child, or do you see the treasure inside? Michelangelo was asked one time, when he had, you know, had these beautiful things that he carved, angels and amazing things, somebody said, how do you know what to do? And he said, I take the marble, and I look for the angel inside. Look for that treasure inside your child. You know, I had a, I was giving a workshop up in Minneapolis once, and this lady said that the school called her one day and said, what's Luke's middle name? And she goes, Jason, I like his dad. And she goes, oh, the teacher said, well, he said it's child of God. <laughs> and, and, the, and, the, and the mother laughed, oh, it's because every night we put him to bed and go, oh, Luke, child of God. We love you. <laughs> and that's so you thought that was his real name. What a great way to have your kids think that their name is child of God, a treasure. Oh, isn't that cool? I love that. So it's just like that mom that said to her child in my office Friday, you're a leader. Leaders don't act. She saw the treasure inside. Isn't that cool? So last one is, oh, yeah, this. Okay, now start going slower. No. <laughs> Here's another one I want to tell you about. This is, I don't think they're, I don't know how active they are, but I think they're still out there. Anybody here of the 40 assets? In um, Minneapolis, there's a, a place called the Search Institute, they re research on growing kids. They design 40 assets that help children grow up to be productive, he healthy adults. 20 internal, 20 external. My favorite one is asset number three. And it said, other adult relationships. You know at least, a child that knows at least three adults beside your parents you can go to for advice and support. You talk with each other often about many different topics, including serious issues. Huge. For Donnie and uh, me, our, our third person was Rosie for our kids. She's a neighbor down the street. That third person, another adult besides the parents. Wow, I love that. So encourage, encourage those healthy things in your children. Well, the last one I have in there is model having fun. What do you do in your families to have fun? And um, do you laugh? Do you have? You know, I think about the little things. Um, where is my? Oh yeah. The Raptors gave me this the first day of school this year. And um, it's a little journal, and I love journals. And uh, so I've used it to write down little things. <laughs> Mrs. Taylor told me this the other day. Um, that she, she says, she always says to her students, patience is a virtue. So she overheard the students say to the other, like Mrs. Taylor says, patience is a virgin. <laughs> Price is our secretary. And so little girl in kindergarten is going to return the, the um, card to 
uh, Colton to the school and see Mr. Christ, and she said, I'll go get back to Mr. Christ. <laughs> <laughs> and so the teacher said, yes, he's our savior. <laughs> Here's another one that said, I like learning about drugs, but all we do is talk about Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. What are we doing? I gotta laugh. I gotta tell you, you know. Um, <laughs> and before the workshop, this uh, workshop for these teachers this year, I asked a couple banks if they would bring in um, a little continental kind of breakfast, you know, for the teachers. And so and they did, and I asked them if they would present about their product uh, too. And so they did. And the second day, I had a farmer state bank. And um, how you rush. And this isn't about your families, but this kind of is, and it's kind of fun. But anyway, it, about family, um, Heidi came in and she presented that lovely little Connell breakfast. She's marketing for Farmer State Bank in Smith Town, and she then was going to, I asked her if she wanted to tell about her product, but she didn't. She said, got up and she said, I love Farmer State Bank. I love what it offers people, and I love that we're here in Waverly. I love Waverly. She goes, I want to put Waverly on the map through Farmer State Bank. And she just went on to tell how passionate she was about it. Then she said, I understand your mission here at St. Paul's with their school. I grew up in the parsonage. My dad was a pastor. I'm just going to tell you a little funny story. And so she went on to tell about how her dad always had to host the evangelists that came into town to their church. And so in the morning before church, her mom would always grill them and say, okay, now you kids, you make sure you go up when that pastor calls you for the children's sermon. So we always did. Well, she said, I'll never forget the time when the evangelist was up there, and he was telling us kids, okay, now, I'm going to describe something, and you tell me what you think it is. It's furry, has a long tail, and it carries nuts in its cheek. And Heidi goes, my brother... He was in the front row and he goes, well, sounds like a squirrel, but it must be Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, that story, you know, has gone down through her family. How are you telling, are you telling, are you sharing those family stories? Are you making your kids laugh? At our table, <laughs> when our kids were growing up, we did so many things. We always had, you know, a big mouth contest, you know. Guess who won? <laughs> it wasn't Donnie. This is too many women in the mouth. I have a big I mean, we sat here. You know, we had all these little things. We'd laugh all the time. And then we'd always, most of the time, we'd laugh at him. <laughs> Every time he'd get laughing, he'd do this in his hair. I mean, so are you just laughing at those goofy little things? Creating humor wherever you can is such a glue for families, I think. And what are those rituals? We always had family sandwiches. You know, so we lay down, one would lay down, then a kid, then a mom, then a kid. I mean, what are you doing, those little rituals that you make you laugh as a family? Those inside jokes, those things. Proverbs 17, 22. A cheerful heart is good medicine, but a downcast spirit dries up the bones. Bring humor. Laugh at yourself. If you blow it with a kid and you yell at the top of your lungs and you think, and then... If at all, just start laughing. I know, we did it. It's whatever you can do to fix something with a little humor is kind of healthy. There is, I'm going to end with one thing, but I want to tell you some other things that I have up here. This is something that I really like to bring. Um, Nurtured Heart is a series. A lot of schools are teaching their teachers and parents and stuff. It's um, transforming the difficult child work with this one. And, and Nurtured Heart Approach is just a wonderful way to give tools of listening and, and um, dealing with difficult situations and raising kids. And so it's good for teachers and it's good for parents. And so I have a couple of my former students that are training this. So, so this is something, if you ever want to Google Nurtured Heart, I think we might try to see what we can do and, and bring a workshop like that sometime. But there's some wonderful things out here. Here's another good one um, that I really enjoyed a lot. He's a researcher, but Paul Tuff on how children succeed. One of the things you'll hear about a lot more is grit. How, you know, we've done so many things in the Spock years of, you know, building this esteem. Then we have these entitled children. Now we don't know what to do. And so everything goes like this. I love being old because you see that everything comes around. And it'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so don't worry, if you just get worried about life, you just come to old people and say, what do you think, is it going to be And people will say, yes, it will come around. 
And so, Britt, how do we build grit in our children that fortitude? All tough. I love that. But I want to end with uh, a little story that I found in, um, and Stephen Covey has a, a book called um, Seven Habits of Highly Effective Families. I love the story that he has in here. And he said, the Chinese bamboo tree, if you plant a bowl, the Chinese bamboo tree, it stays in the ground and a little green shoot comes up out of the ground and that's all you see for four years. But during the four years, an immense root system is building below the surface of the ground so that in the fifth year, it shoots up 80 feet. Remember the Chinese family tree. When you're at the end of your rope, you're building a root system in your children. And you're doing the best you can. I wrote a, a book on cesarean birth with a friend of mine. And um, actually, she, her daughter teaches at Walker now. But anyway, I remember she said, she was one of those who just stayed like this. And one day Mary said, I know if my children grow up to be drug addicts and stuff, it won't be my fault, because I've done my best. <laughs> Remember that. You've done your best. Remember the movie Love Actually? Did anybody ever see that movie Love Actually? My favorite part of that movie is this guy is so in love with the, the Kira Knightley, you know, the one that plays that. And she was married to somebody else. So Christmas Eve, he went up and he has this boom and he has these cards, and he rings the doorbell, and she leads her husband to go downstairs to answer the door. And he stands her with the cards and says, tell him it's carolers. And she goes, it's carolers, and he puts on the music. And then he has these signs, and he goes, because it's Christmas, I just want to tell you, I love you, and I always will. He, he keeps throwing down cards that say these words. And then he says, Merry Christmas. And he starts walking down the street. And pretty soon, she, he hears her running after him. And they, they face each other, and she gives him a kiss. And then she goes back to her husband. He continues walking down the street, and he goes, that's enough. <laughs> Do your best. God tells us he is there to pick up the pieces. I just got a, um, an email from my mentor's mom, mentee's mom, and she said, what's your favorite Bible verse? And I said, Isaiah 55, 11. And so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but shall prosper where I send it. Just trust God to help you do it enough. What you say, he'll fix the words that come out. He's given us his promise. Will you pray with me? Oh God, we come to you as busy people trying to raise children, trying to be grandparents, trying to be parents, trying to be children of our parents. Help us to be wise. Help us to model what you want us to be, what you would have done. <laughs> 